John Churchman is a local farmer who's finding international fame through his furry friends, the unique way in which he's raising them, how he's becoming a household name, and much more on Connect. Connect on Vermont PBS is sponsored in part by the Alma Gibbs Donchin Foundation, supporting Vermont institutions that support the underserved and promoting the betterment of life for all. John, thank you so much for having us today. Oh, well, thanks for coming. This truly is a treat to get out on the road and to meet your furry family, to explore all your beautiful piece of property has to offer. But this is a really different way of living than you're accustomed to. You were living in New York City before you made the move up to Vermont. So how did you wind up here? Well, I mean, we're, we're going back in time here a ways. This was the mid-1980s, and I came up to go to Bread and Puppet Theater in the summer, and I had been down living in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. I was working as in commercial art and photography and illustration work, and um, <clears throat> someone had just tried to mug me. And so I, I came up here, and I thought, well, this is a lot. <laughs> I like it a lot more up here. And I just ended up staying that uh, and moved up that, that fall of 84. So 84, you've been here since then, mm -hmm. but the farm hasn't been in your life for as long as you've been here. We're talking 30 years you've been in Vermont. You know, well, this, this farm is 12 years. 12 years. And uh, <clears throat> I actually, I, I, when I grew up down in Virginia, um, my folks had a, my grandparents had a farm. And so I, I grew up, uh, you know, helping my uncle on the dairy farm and uh, uh, baling hay in the summer. And I really loved the farm and always loved, that was one of my favorite memories as, as a child was going to visit my grandmother's farm and, and working on the farm. So <clears throat> there was always in the back of my mind that someday I would get back to do, you know, to, to be a farmer once again. And that's the thing, a lot of times farming is in mm -hmm. someone's blood. Mm -hmm. You just don't decide one day, hey, I think I'm going to own my own farm. And not to take the words out of your mouth, <laughs> but this seems like a lot of work. Oh, it is. It's a it's a good bit of, good bit of work. We have um well we have a flock of 18 sheep and we have our four dogs and we have uh chickens and ducks and geese and turkeys and uh so in our garden. So we we have a it, it's what you'd call a small sort of small little sustainable farm. Excellent. And you said it's <clears> off <throat> the grid. You're living very sustainable. We saw the beautiful solar panels out front. Right now our equipment is hooked up because you have that solar power running through the barn as well. And this barn, this structure is stunning. How old is the structure that we're sitting in right now? This is a month old. <clears throat> brand new. This is brand new, yeah. So this was built from the, this was all from the, 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 the wood all came from the property. We, we, we lumbered it here and then we, I brought in a portable sawmill which is actually sitting right out front right now. And we milled this all this last summer, and then it was built by uh, my, my farmhand, and he built the barn. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. You've always been an artist, and it's one of your more recent works that's really put you on the map, and it's resonating with audiences far and wide. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on, but another one of your main passions is photography. Right. Now, mm -hmm. do you dedicate time to photography specifically do you just have your camera on you as you're walking around your land I usually always have a camera you know that's because I don't <clears throat> with what I take here I have a camera and it depends on when the light you know the light comes out in a certain moment you'll get it it'll break through and so I try to always have a camera <laughs> that's sure. that's more and I do dedicate time I there's generally it's the early morning and the late evening. It's either it's sunsets and sunrises is what I really look for. And then I, I, I like I do a lot of moon photography too, but I like that um, the early type time when the lights the lights coming in and then the late evening when you get the sunset light. That's sort of my favorite times. So those times I kind of do set aside for doing photography. And a little bit later you're going to walk us into your studio. So for the folks at home, this is going to be a treat for us. John Churchman is going to give us an exclusive tour of his studio inside his house. Now, in terms of photography, you're sort of old school. In this digital age, you ch still decide to shoot manually. Why is that? Well, <clears throat> we'll have to, let's, we'll get one thing straight. I actually do shoot digitally, but I do a lot of manual settings digitally. I, I switched over to digital in 2004 when they, you know, it sort of started to get to the same level as what you could do with slide film and, uh, 
And so, but what I do is I shoot a lot of things on a manual setting because I'm either shooting like a moonrise or maybe how the moon looks through the, the smoke coming up from the, from the fireplace or a lot of things like this sort of, you know, situations in here where you don't want to use flash. So, you, you know, it's a lot of slow, slow stuff off a tripod. I do, that's how I do a lot of my photography. And there are so many factors that go into capturing a wonderful picture, but mm -hmm. what are some of the secrets that you can maybe share out there with aspiring photographers? Well, one of the most important ones that I can think right off the bat is to, is to actually get down low when you're photographing and think about shooting. We normally shoot from right here. And so everything is sort of at this level, but it's a far more interesting is to say, take your camera and take it down here and shoot up. And a lot of the, the photography I did with the sheep has always been from a, from a place of getting down, because one of our sheep, Sweet Pea, um, people always comment on how she smiles. Well, she smiles if you get a little lower in how you photograph her. So that's one of the things I would say. The other thing I would say is what I mentioned about sunsets and sunrises. You know, look for the times when the light is really beautiful. Like right now with, you know, sun, sunsets around four and the light is so low in the sky and you get this beautiful golden light that comes in right toward the in the evening so i do a lot of going out in that and the other thing i'd really suggest is to use the manual settings on your camera so that you are both um, manually exposing it so that you you know you're able to to develop like shadow areas or light areas and that really takes more of an adjustment because when you're using the um, program mode that just automatically does everything it's making a choice for you. So what I would suggest is making some of those choices yourself in terms of, say, shutter speed. I would also highly recommend shooting a lot off of a tripod. And for that reason, if you say you're taking pictures of the moon, you need to shoot it off a tripod. You need to use a, you know, the, the timer so that there, you, you reduce the, the amount of vibration, that sort of thing going on. Um, and I'd also vary, like the f-stop. You want to shoot uh, what they call bokeh which is um, depth of field so if you're shooting say fast and you open your f-stop way up then you'll get you'll get um, say just the front of laddie's nose would be sharp and then the rest of them goes off into out of focus or if you want to shoot a really you know deep depth of field you want to shoot say like an f-22 you want to close it really way down so those are the sort of things i would i would recommend so there are a lot of factors that go into finessing Yes, your photography. There are. You said the tripod. Now I can imagine using the tripod in certain situations such as photographing your friends mm -hmm. might be a little bit more of a challenge because they're so lively. I mean they've been mm -hmm. wandering in and out of the barn the whole time we've been here. Folks may be familiar with your work and not even know it. Vermont Life Magazine for example that's one of the places that your work has been featured. Mm -hmm. Any other places that people may have seen your photography and might not have even known? Well, let's see, I did, I did the work for New England Culinary for about four years over in Montpelier, and I did their view books and all their chef photography and all their food photography. So I, I've done a lot of commercial work. The state of Vermont, I did um, some of the visitor's guides for them. I did the actual, the road map for the state of Vermont. I can actually show you a couple of those things. Um, I mean, a long time ago, I used to work for IBM. I did work for them, and I've worked for a lot of different uh, as a you know as a freelance graphic artist I've done a lot of work for a lot of different people um, the end of Essex had all my work in the tavern for a number of years uh, New England culinary uh, there some of the restaurants have it up and so those are some of the places Great. locally so it's been out and about mm -hmm. frog, frog hollow, hollow yes. too. yep yeah primarily frog hollow I also have a line of cards called brick house studios and so the cards have been out in uh, bookstores and in various places around around the area for a while Wonderful. and Brickhouse Studios obviously your home is set on these beautiful 12 acres no, it's actually land. 20 23 23 acres mm -hmm. been here 12 years mm -hmm. situated on the 23 acres of land your home is a beautiful brick house when was that constructed 2000 2000 <clears throat> So it is. It's more of a. It's a. It's a newer. It's a new new brick house. It is. Okay. And Brick House Studios comes from our brick house. Sure. Yeah. And Brick House Studios, a lot of your work once again features your furry little friends. And John actually allowed us to take a tour of the barn and meet some of his friends. Come on, Lammy. 
And look at that, they follow like sheep, huh? So, one remarkable image that we see here is everybody gets together in harmony. It doesn't matter the sheep, the horse, the chicken. Tell us a little bit about their relationship together, the animals. Well, the, actually the, the, the mini pony is sort of the, uh, the, top, the top animal so here, cute. to say the least. She kind of keeps them all in order. Then that's uh, Ollie, our ram over there. He's on that side because he's a little aggressive. This is Prim. Hi. Prim is in the book. She sure. was a friend of Sweet Pea. Absolutely. And How Sweet much she's Pea, grown. Sweet Pea's right there. And here's the star yeah, of the Sweet show Pea. right over here hey, Sweet with Pea. the permanent Sweet smile Pea. on her face. Yeah. She's Hi, very Sweet friendly. Hunter. She's like, where's my grain? <laughs> <laughs> but they, they all get along really quite well. And, uh, you know, they, they, because basically they're, they're like Sweet Pea is a bottle lamb and so is Prim. So you see how friendly sure. they are. The, the difference, most sheep are, um, they're, they'll run from you. They'll mm. get as far away as they can, whereas a lot of these are bottle lambs. So because they're bottle lambs, they're very friendly and they'll come right up. Hi, sweetheart. And then this is, this is one of this year's bottle lambs. This is okay. Hazel. And look at the size and difference. And that's Sunny right there. Sunny was Whoa. also in the story. The yes. story we had Sweet Pea, we had Absolutely. Sunny. We had Prim, who's, this is Prim. She's a little Scottish black face. Okay. She was a really tiny little, um, lamb when she was born and she's like very friendly and I was going They're more to say, like dog-like really is what you'd really you know that's really how I sort of see them well and you have your golden up on the hill as well and all the animals they sort mm -hmm. of have that golden retriever mentality so happy to see you they'll come right up to you mm -hmm. so prim and sweet pea are around the same age Prim, Sweet Pea, Sunny, yep. and uh, Violet, which is right here. Sure. Um, they're all the same age. They're all. They're all. They were born in uh, March, so this March they'll be two. Okay. And now Sweet Pea was orphaned. Now, mm -hmm. when we say orphaned in terms of lamb or sheep, it's a little different than a human being right. orphaned. So when you say that she was orphaned. How did you know that she was orphaned? Was she neglected? Did mom go her own way and That's say... That's mom right there. Oh, oh, so maybe they've made amends, huh? They can be in the same pen together. Well, this is Blossom, and Blossom had mis mastitis. Okay. And so she could no longer, she couldn't take care of them. And so really what happens when the, the term orphan lambs is generally if you have triplets, the third lamb will, the mother can only take care of, say, two of them. So the, the, tri the triplet will become a, a bottle lamb. In this case... Um, the mother um, got mastitis and she couldn't nurse them. So both Violet, um, Violet and Sweet Pea came up to the house first. And so they were, um, so when we say orphan bottle lambs, that's, they, sure. their mother really is still with us. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So mom was sick in this case. Mm -hmm. Now where's Finn? Finn is going to be the next famous face. Did he make his way out here or he's... Finn is right there. See, there Finn, he is. the okay. story about Finn is Finn is very shy. He doesn't always come out. Okay. He's learning to overcome um, being shy. He's, he's scared of things. Like he's, he's a very timid little fellow. Okay. Hey, Finny. Yeah, they're being you know, true to character over there. Huh? Yeah, he, he's, in, he's in character. But we can kind of get him to come out. If I brought a little grain out, he would be out sure. here in a moment. Sure. And he is the next book yes. that you're working on. He is. All right, John, you've allowed us into your beautiful home and into your studio. So this is where all the magic happens. You print your portraits. You conceptualize. We're going to do a quick scan of the wall here because we don't want to give too much away. What's going on over here? Well, this is actually our storyboard. This is the wall that we're working on for the story of the, the brave and little mighty Finn. Uh, as you can see, the brave and mighty little Finn. So what we're doing is we're basically comping out all the different um, spreads. There are 16 spreads in the book. And as we get them to the point that we're happy with, then they go up on the wall. Beautiful. We're going to move right along. We've seen some of your beautiful photography before, but you have it very beautifully displayed over here. So. Mount Mansfield right there. Right. One of, one of my um, favorite images over time has been, has been Mount Mansfield. I've done a lot of work on that. Like that's a view, of, that's one of the views of the mountain, you know, taken in the winter and then of course the fall views. And you were talking about lighting before mm -hmm. when we were out in the barn. Look at that lighting. I mean, how do you capture that? Are there several different speeds? Do you have to... 
work well, around what's this, natural and what's... This one here is actually, that's actually, um, that's actually a photomontage. It was shot in 12 separate exposures and it was actually shot uh, with chrome film. It, it predated digital and this was, the top was this, this section here and this section here. And then it was all, and then I put it all together um, and stitched it all together. It was shot at one time. But the idea is that I expose for the different areas, like in, when you're photographing like the highlights here, this area goes dark. So you photograph them separately, it's kind of zone photography, and so you, you photograph for the highlight area, you photograph for the shadow area, and you photograph for the midtone area, and then you put them all, you combine them. It's sort of how the eye sees something, but a camera, if you do an overall exposure, the camera can't capture that, because the dark areas go too dark, in order to get you know detail in the light areas. And you've talked about before in other speeches that you've given about your photography how in Vermont this is such a staple. It's hard to really capture that light. The way the sun breaks and hits the trees, absolutely stunning. We walked in and we had a, another work in progress up on the computer screen. So what is going on here? This one is um, a dragonfly. And Finn is concerned about the dragonfly. It buzzes, it makes noise. He's, he's, he's apprehensive about it. And his friend Atticus is actually going to help him kind of overcome the difficulty of being scared of something. So no that's... No pun intended. We saw Finn. He is very sheepish. He's, he's a little very on the shy side compared yeah. to Sweet Pea who would walk right no, up to you. No, there's Sweet Pea. Sweet Pea has Beautiful. a lot of attitude. No, she is sassy. This is the New York Times best-selling book that was co-authored by your wife, Sweet Pea and Friends, The Sheep Over. How did this story come to be? We met Sweet Pea a little while ago, but how did Sweet Pea become the star of the story? Well, Sweet Pea, she got injured a year ago, back in January. And what happened was, um, as she, she got sick, and so we ended up taking her up to the greenhouse beside our house, and we had her in, in there, and we brought another one of her lamb friends, Prim, who was another one of our bottle lambs, and she came up and she was with Sweet Pea. And so the story actually starts, this is Laddie, okay. and uh, Laddie down here. And Laddie, um, in, in the story, Laddie kind of alerts me as to the fact that Sweet Pea's not doing well. And so we bring her up to the house and, as she, and then we have the vet who comes, Vet Allison, who comes and basically saves her life. And then um, and when she gets better, she's going to have a party, which we call the sheep over. And that's really <laughs> where it all came from. So she could have all, all the farmyard friends could come over and have a party with her. And so these are actually, in terms of the spreads, like the fox was down on our lower property. A lot of these um, ice, these are all ice patterns that occurred on the windows around the greenhouse when she was sick. And John, this book really does blend all of your passions. It blends your photography, mm -hmm your love for your animals, and your artistic ability. You're also a graphic designer I am, yes. as well. So this was the first attempt at writing a book. What was that experience like? Well, we had a, we had a really great time here. I'll show you some of my, like this is one of my favorite spreads. Um, so in terms of the photography, if you look at it, the goose is one of the, the geese from our flock. This is one of our roosters. These ice patterns that you see taking place here are up on the greenhouses. And then this is the sunrise coming through. So it, it does, as you say, it combines a lot of my, you know, artistic things that I've worked on over the years. Gorgeous. And being here, this is such a treat for us today because it really brings the book to life and I think you've done such a wonderful job for people who have purchased the book those who have been able to get it at their library you really do pull them into your everyday life oh thank you so with Sweet Pea becoming this social media star how much of your fame and success do you contribute to social media well the social media has given me a platform so that people you know, throughout the country and actually around the world follow my photography. And it's, it's kind of like having this online gallery. So as I go about my day, I'll, I'll usually take one or two pictures a day that I really like. And so I'll post them and then they'll get a lot of comments and a lot of feedback. And it allowed me to, um, the whole social media thing allowed me to do a Kickstarter campaign, which was really key to getting the whole Sweet Pea funded. Sure. And over 500 people contributed to your Kickstarter campaign. Mm -hmm. 
you raised onward <clears throat> of $26,000. Now, from a publishing perspective, how far does $26,000 go? Well, we actually, we initially, we went in for $10,000. And that was our original goal. And $10,000 will buy you about 3,000 books. And um, so what we were looking at is to get primarily the cost of the printing covered. And so when we launched the Kickstarter campaign, within 15 hours we got to 10000 And then over the course of the 45 days it went to 26000 And then through what we called a backer kit, which was a follow-on, we actually raised $40,000 as a total. $40,000. Yeah, $40, yeah. You were hoping for 10000 which by no means, that's not a modest amount. Mm -hmm. You were hoping just to raise enough funds to go ahead and get 3,000 books published. You ended up getting, with the first run, 4,000. We ended up, we actually, we bumped it to 4,000 because when you're actually trying to get the best book possible, what we did is with Sweet Pea, we ended up getting a heavier cover, or we went for a heavier paper, or we went for a lot of what we figured were like the Cadillac thing. Well, I was talking to the printer, I said, you know, I want the best book you can possibly make. And we, we also did it in the U.S., yeah. which is, is more expensive than, say, going to China, but we really felt very strongly that we wanted to print it in the, in, in the United States. So we did that. And we went to 4000 because it dropped the price down enough for us to add, to, you know, add some extra pages inside, some extra spreads, and, you know, to make it the best book possible. And, and um, so that's, that's how we did that. <laughs> and now, with that, you have actually partnered up with Little Brown Publishing. They are helping you not only with the promotion and press for Sweet Pea and Friends, The Sheep Over, but you have some big plans coming down the line. Why don't you tell us what's next for John Churchman and your wife Jennifer, who is the co-author of the right. book. Why don't you tell us what's next for the both of you? Well, the background with the, the story was when we, we printed Sweet Pea and we had our 4,000, we had sold, I think, around 1,200 online. And then we started to sell them and we went into bookstores and I, I took it over to the Flying Pig bookstore over in Shelburne. And she actually did an online, uh, in, she actually did a um, story on it that was in Publishers Weekly. And the day that that story ran, we had agents from around the U.S. calling us literary agents. So we ended up going with uh, Brenda Bowen from Greenberger Associates in New York City. And she was, she's very well known as a, to rep, in terms of repping various children's books, people. And so that's how we got to Little Brown. And so there was actually an auction. There were five publishers that were bidding on, on the rights to the book. And so we did, we did the whole story with that. And we ended up getting a three book deal with Little Brown. A three book deal, which, mm -hmm. as we said before, it's put you on the New York Times bestsellers list. Mm -hmm. You were on it, fell off it, but you just announced as we sat down today, you are back on the list. So, congratulations. Now, well, we've, we've been on it for two, we've been on it for the last two weeks. You have. Right. So, and uh, so we don't know what next week holds at this point. <laughs> <laughs> well, we hope it brings nothing but good news. Right. It sounds like it's really found its niche. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a friend in California who sent me a photo of her daughter in the library. They were in the children's section of the library and completely ironic, unbeknownst, there was a picture of Sweet Pea right above her daughter's <laughs> head. So the reach of this book mm -hmm. is absolutely remarkable. You've reached far and wide with this book, as you said, overseas at this point. How are you dealing with all this fame and success? I mean, you went from a farmer, photographer, your work was well known, but now you have made TV appearances, you've been on the radio. This is something that I don't want to say is out of your normal realm, but it's not your everyday life. How are you dealing with all these changes and has it really changed your day-to-day -day routine? Well, as you can see the barn, you know, the animals, they always want to be fed. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a pretty steady right. thing. Money and in your pocket is food in their right. mouth, right? Maisie, come here, come here. This is Maisie. So Maisie... Maisie is actually going to be in one of, is in our third book. And uh, it's, our third book's called The Adventures of Laddie and Maisie Grace. And right now I'm working on um, the, the Little Brave and Mighty Finn, which is our second book. And in terms of like routines, it hasn't actually, you know, changed what I, 
what I do in terms of farming, and you get up, you feed the animals, you take care of them. I'm working on another book. It allows me just to pretty much stay home. And this is my client, you know, sure. Sweet Pea and, and the book series are really is, is what I'm working on right now. That's, that's what I do. Absolutely. And I've had the honor of reading the book, and I hope the folks out there will be able to get their hands on the book as well. But John Churchman, I thank you so very much for your time. You're welcome. And thanks to you folks at home as well. We want to connect with you and keep the conversation going. Head over to our website, vermontpbs.org. Until next time. Thank you. Connect on Vermont PBS is sponsored in part by the Alma Gibbs Donchin Foundation supporting Vermont institutions that support the underserved and promoting the betterment of life for all.